Dotsy. Thanks so much for making the time. Oh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad we finally hooked up and got it together. It was hard we for our did. schedules there for a bit. Yes, and it was good timing because I actually watched the Game Changers for the first time yesterday. It's been on my list for all oh. this time. And I've watched <laughs> interviews of people talking about it. And your name has come up multiple times, and which is kind of how we just we decided to connect and finally got a chance to watch it and was just so fascinated by your story. And I don't think it really shined on the beginnings of what you went through and the mentality of, uh, you know, the, what you've developed into. And, you know, we'll get into all of that. We'll get into the, you know, the, 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 the diet that you're really advocating for and your past history. But, um, you know, I'm particularly fascinated with, with high performance like yourself, like Olympians, because, you know, in, in the sport that you do, you're talking about a hundredth of a second mm -hmm. that leads to the gold medal or potentially last place. <laughs> and it's, it's just such a crazy mindset to have, um, you know, how, I guess for people that aren't aware, like what was the beginning of this story? Cause I also know you, you started quite late. The, the beginning of my cycling journey. Uh, even before, I think we need to be, we need to go over the, you know, the, the, the struggles that you've been through before you even got into cycling and, and what got you there in yeah. the first place. Yeah. Well, I did enter cycling a little bit of a, a, an untraditional route. I was, I was 26 when I picked up a bike and started riding and really cycling. Gosh, it was, it was a vehicle, um, towards the end of, of a recovery journey for me, quite frankly, I was very sick with anorexia for a little over five years and almost lost my life, life to it a couple of times. Didn't want to get better for a long time. Uh, it was my worst enemy and best friend, but eventually I knew I was going to, you know, lose my life if, if I didn't at least try. And so I did went through a couple of therapists, couple of treatment places, but ended with, um, ended up with a phenomenal therapist. She's a meditation, meditative therapist. Uh, and she and I worked really hard for a couple of years and got to a place where I was healthy again and, and living, at least living, at least able to hold a job again, and at least able to have some you know, rich relationships and some, some love and have experiences in my life again, that were positive. And one of those uh, was cycling because she mentioned to me, gosh, maybe our, you know, third to last session or something. She said, you know, I really want you to be able to move your body in a healthy way again, which I hadn't been able to do for a long time because I had the over-exercise component to anorexia, which so many do. And so I had just a very unhealthy relationship for, for multiple, multiple different reasons and in different ways. Uh, but one of those was extreme over-exercise spending up to seven, eight hours a day in the gym. So she said, I want you to be able to move again healthfully, but I want you to pick something that uh, just feels different than anything that you did before, that you had an unhealthy relationship. And in the gym, I would choose the elliptical and the Stairmaster and the treadmill. So the bike was very different. Uh, and it felt just, quite frankly, it just felt like it would be very freeing because I was living out in Los Angeles by the time. And I thought, what, what a freeing experience to ride up and down Pacific Coast Highway and into the Santa Monica Mountains and just have the wind in my face. And and you know, be able to be out of the, the chains and the confines of, of my anorexia uh, and experience life in that way in such a exhilarating and moving uh, way like you do on the bicycle. So that's how it all started. It, it really just was that in the beginning. Yeah. Like I just rode a bike up and down PCH and, and into the mountains. And, uh, but I fell madly in love with it very quickly. And uh, there just started to, I started to have questions, you know, could I, could I possibly race, try a race? Like, what might this feel like if I took, you know, kept going with this? Uh, I knew that I had a little bit of natural talent at it. I, I, I was able to kind of pick that up early on riding with, with um, other people and, and, and guys that were stronger and faster. And it kind of clued me in that uh, I was a bit stronger than someone who maybe had just you know, <laughs> just started, which sure. was me. So anyway, so you seem relatively that was the, fit. You were, you were working out 
like multiple times throughout the day well, beforehand as well? No, I would say I was very, it, my body had a lot of, a lot of rebuilding and a lot of regeneration to do, you know? So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starving myself while I'm, um, you know, working out of the gym like that. So, you know, it really at the end of people that die of this disease normally have a heart attack because your body, uh, it's, it's so depleted that it starts to eat its own organs is, is what happens. And so, um, I was in such a ripped down, tear, torn down state that I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it anywhere, anywhere in the realm of, of fit. It was, it, I had a lot to rebuild and a lot to come back from. And I was, I, by that point, I was you know, really, really, really well in terms of my relationship with food and my relationship with myself. And, and, you know, I was, you know, eating healthfully again and fueling my body and everything, but uh, my heart was not strong because my heart had been damaged during the day. It's because before when you were, when you, when you had the eating disorder, you were going to the gym, not to necessarily feel great, but it's the, for the sole purpose of looking great. Well, I it's said, a, it's a, it's a, there's a big misnomer out there that, that um, you know, anorexia has uh, almost everything to do with an outward appearance. And, and that, that could be the case for, for some, but for the, by and large, uh, if you want to have a, just a kind of like a super quick tutorial on, on anorexia, it, it's, it really can be, can be compared to any other, um, you know, addictive, destructive behavior like drug addiction or alcohol addiction or sex addiction. It's really just the poison that I picked to act out on my inner pain and, mm -hmm. and, and anxiety and misery and fear and all of those things that lead us down a path to addictive behavior. So it, for whatever reason, it was just, it was the poison that I picked. I mean, I also had a drug problem during that period of time, but the anorexia was something that gave me a sense of control. It's really hard to starve yourself. And, and you, you, you feel very empowered and very in control when you are, you know, taking down your calories to, you know, under 300 a day. And I was in such a, a, a painful place in my life that uh, it, exerting that, that tight kind of control felt good. And it started to give me a high when I was able to control, um, to that degree to starve myself. So the gym was just about more control. The gym was more about, you know, losing more weight so that I had more control. And I was, I was in the driver's seat. I was in charge of my own, you know, existence and, and really having nothing to do with the outward appearance, because quite frankly, back then, I mean, I, I looked, I looked older than I look now and I'm, I'm 25 years older. It's, it's just, it's so destructive. I, my skin was gray, my hair was falling out. My, my teeth were kind of dark and, and gray. Um, you know, it just, the, the, the outward appearance of someone who's that sick is not attractive, I guess I'll say. All right. And this is when you were modeling. This is back, back in the day. Well, this modeling. is, this is even after that, because it got much, much um, worse after I, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of petered out, if you will, with modeling because I, I would just, I got so sick I couldn't work. I mean, I couldn't work at any job. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I cut off all relationships. I was basically just kind of in solitude. Got it, got it. And was it similar to? Is was there is there a similar reason that most people that face anorexia is there a common path or reason that you go through? Or did you have a particular? Everyone has their own particular path, of course. But right. was it was it a similar? Um, pressure. And, and I ask this because I've, and don't quote me on this, but I, I've read somewhere that women mm -hmm. generally face five times more anorexia versus mm -hmm. men. And yeah, I wonder, it, was it, it was it like society's pressure well, to, yeah. No, it, did, it wasn't an outward. I mean, and it can be, but for me, it wasn't. But okay. the, the statistics that we do know about it are that about 30%, between 30 and 35% of anorexics have um, some kind of uh, sexual abuse in their past. Uh, and so they are looking for a way to disappear, to not be noticed, right? Uh, after having gone through such a horrifying ordeal as that. That was not me. I did not have that type of abuse in my history. Um, so 
you know, the, the, the rest of the 70% probably have all sorts of myriads of, of reasoning, but really, truly, you can, you can compare it to um, just a way to act out on inner pain. So, you know, the inner pain could, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a million reasons why someone is in a state that they are in, that they want to go snort lines of cocaine all night, get so drunk they can't remember their name, uh, starve themselves to the degree that I did, right? It's just a, it's an, it's a numbing out or an acting out on what's really going on in your right. life. And when you say starve yourself, cause I mean, I have done, I mean, in some ways, like people when, when they fast mm -hmm. today, you know, with, with, you know, intermittent fasting that can sometimes be perceived as like a positive thing in some sense where mm -hmm. I can relate where like, yeah, you, cause I did a three day fast couple of years ago. And there is this level of control that you can push your mind to a different level mm -hmm. than you couldn't have. And, and you do feel a sense of accomplishment and, and feeling like you're bolder, uh, just having gone through that. And mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to know, like, what was the level of, uh, suffering, you know, and, and the, and the starvation that you're going through, was it like a 12 mm -hmm. hour, like 24 hours a day sometimes, or what was kind of the cycle that you were going through? Well, I was, really interested in and in feeling that sense of control. So I was very specific and meticulous around when I would eat, what I would eat and how much. So I would eat and it, it, it you know, got worse. So I would eat in the beginning, it was like, you know, 800 calories a day. And then it got down to 600 and then 400, right? It just went down into the end where it was 150. Uh, calories a day, but I would eat in these really tiny amounts at, at that, you know, <laughs> that's not that much. So, uh, but a, a few different times a day and, and it was almost like a challenge, right. Controlling myself to only put in whatever 50 calories or whatever that might be. So it was a, it was a whole scene, a whole system that, you know, to, to really, as I look back on it, um, I could usurp more control than if I just didn't eat at all. Right. But obviously that's not nearly enough to sustain, especially with the over exercise aspect of it. And as you know, when you fast for about three days, you get that, uh, that euphoria, right? You, you get a euphoria from starving yourself. And that's, I think really, because we are built to survive, right? So I guess we, you know, at, at, the, at the base, like primal level, if you're actually starving in the wilderness, you know, your body goes into a bit of a euphoric state, state so there's not so much suffering involved. I'm assuming that's how our bodies, why our bodies are set up that way, because it's very euphoric when you're truly, you know, way under feeding yourself or starving yourself. And that became an addiction for me, like finding that mm. euphoria. And I think that's what you're talking about, where you get that great sense of accomplishment. But after three days or so, it's like, it's interesting that the, 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 the hormonal response and the chemical release that happens that creates that euphoric state when you are starving, which is what your body thinks happening when you're fasting, obviously. And then, yeah. and then you feed it again. It's not, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. I mean, through, throughout the, the, the kind of the struggles that you went through, I'm trying to pinpoint some of the things that mm -hmm. were perhaps transferable to this great career that you had, which is the <laughs> level of discipline that you must have had right to to be and, and and just the organization of of being able to go through the suffering particularly yeah. you know as a, as a cyclist um is that something you perhaps have developed through this process that you went through uh with, with the eating disorder or is that something you've already had and you've just kind of <laughs> developed it further well i think maybe that you know i was i was always a really determined little girl i wanted to do everything myself i didn't want any help i didn't want any assistance i didn't want anyone tying my shoes even when i was 2 you know it was like i mm -hmm. i had a, a, a you know a, a real desire uh, to 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 make it on my own and i had that just kind of built in real determination to fight through whatever might come my way. But I, I think that the, the, the suffering aspect definitely came from anorexia. And I remember really training you know, super hard, just all, all the time uh, if for cycling. And I, you know, we would do intervals, right? Like that's one way that you train. So maybe you're going to do, um, you know, five by 10 minute intervals or something, and you're going to go pretty, 
pretty hard. And I remember just doing them and I could go so much deeper than some of my friends that I was doing intervals with, or that I knew that were cyclists, because for me, I was just elated by the fact that the suffering would end. Whereas in my anorexia, like I didn't think there was ever going to be an end to the suffering. So once I, Mm. once I got better and once I healed and once I went to cycling, it was like, suffering was like nothing to me because nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, it it, it hurts really bad, but it's definitely going to end. Like by six o'clock tonight, I'm definitely going to be on the couch, like hanging with my husband and we're going to be having like, there's no, but anorexia was like, it was, I never saw a way out for years until I did. So Mm. I thought that I would, I absolutely thought that I would die from it. So that, that, you know, ability to suffer and, and look back and realize like this, this is never, you know, this is, it's never going to hurt as bad as it did. And it's always going to end. And so then it's like, I could go to really, you know, sick, deep places in the pain cave. Cause wow. I knew I would, I would come out, you know, whether it was an hour from then or like, you know, I was probably never going to be much longer than that, whatever, it, whatever it would be an hour or two and, and it's going to be over and I'm going to be able to take a shower and it's all going to be fine. So. Do you feel in some ways that was your competitive advantage, this, this ability to suffer and the history that you've had with this versus some of the competitors that you've gone through? Yeah, probably. I mean, not at the elite level, like the, at, at, at the uh, Olympic level, everyone's suffering that bad They're you know, or they're not yeah. training hard enough, but yeah, like through the ranks, like the people that I competed against when I was a, uh, you know, cycling, you start as a category four in a race and you have to get points to go up to the next category, you know, but most of it for safety reasons so that you're not, yeah. you know, crashing out the pros, but um, definitely through the amateur ranks, like I think my ability to go so much deeper, you know, it's really accelerated my uh, physical ability and physical output more than the next. Yeah, the, there must be something there because I, I understand you started at 26 when you first kind of mm-hmm. rode your bicycle, which is crazy, by the way, right? It, the, the, how quickly you've been able to rise through the ranks and perform at the highest level. And I think, that, yeah, I, I can only imagine there was some transferability around the the, the suffering that you went through. You know, I th- we've, we've had Stephen Kotler on the show who talks about flow mm-hmm. a lot and he was talking mm-hmm. about how flow is always transferable. So when you have flow in the process of biking, it's going to, it's going to go transfer through where you're going to be able to get the flow faster when you're doing creative work, let's say, or other things in your life. And yeah, um, yeah, it's almost like you could have done other sports and also just been able to rise to the highest level. Have you thought about in an alternative? Well, mm, probably not like gymnastics or beach volleyball some, yeah. there's a few in yeah. there that yeah. i think there's i would have to start skills. <laughs> exactly yes. yes yeah but maybe endurance i mean i don't know it's, it's that's it's like impossible to really ever kind of go back but i to know mm-hmm. what what could have been but i uh i have laughed before about like i'm glad i said to my therapist well i'd like to try cycling when she's like you know pick something that's healthy because i was living in venice beach i could have picked beach volleyball um well, first of all, I'm only five, nine, so that probably wouldn't have worked out either, <laughs> but you know, there's some sports that I think that, you know, would, would have been almost impossible to, to, to be able to eke into, but that flow thing is, is really fascinating. Cause I post cycling into my career now running a nonprofit. I've, mm. I feel like I've had to, like, it's the same, I'm the same me and I'm motivated by the same reasons. And I'm still, I'm very hard on myself. And that makes me very hard on the people that, work for me. And I, I feel like that flow I've, I've had to learn to adjust my flow to work in a team environment. Um, Mm. yeah, it's been, it's been the great, I, it's been more challenging than the, than even the cycling thing. Cause I kind of came into it. Talk to me about the process. Yeah. Well, it feels like I, I came in and was like, okay, so here's one thing I, and this is not saying, oh, this is great or not great or whatever. It just is. It just, was the case. When I came into cycling, I started, you know, working really hard at it and and racing and everything. I would come to training every single day with my very best. Now my very best didn't always translate to winning or even, you know, the top five, but I brought, I brought it. I brought my very best. So in, in the, in, in a team environment work, 
it turns out not everyone does that. And as a leader, I just, the, at the beginning, it was like, what the hell are they doing? What, what is it? What, you know, like that just, it didn't make sense to me in any other realm of, of I couldn't, there, nobody could give me a reason why you wouldn't bring your, bring your best. And sometimes your best isn't good enough. And I was used to that. Like sometimes my best wasn't good enough, but I would bring it. So that's an example of, I had to sort of change like what my, my flow to adjust to the reality of the world. And I'm not even saying that bringing your best self is how you should do things every day. It just was what I did and what I was used to and how I got the best out of myself. Um, and then just personality flow. Like I'm an extreme introvert, which no one believes, but I am. I, I'm almost never like really? the, the pandemic. Maybe you're was like just an like, ambivert. Can you no. turn it on? Like you're turned on right now, right? You, right. But mostly, as you know, it's about how you gain and, and contain your energy, right? right? Introvert, extrovert, advert. So I, this will drain me and then I'll just shut off with my husband for the rest of the night. Like, and it's, it's, it, and it's, so it's, it's just, I mean, it just sort of is what it is. It just, yeah. um, you can turn it on, but I'm, introverts are usually good. And one-on-one, like I love really solid, rich relationships with one person, or I like to speak in front of 5,000 people. Oh man, 10, relate. 10 people on a Zoom, it literally gives me anxiety attacks, like badly. When Clubhouse came out, I was like, that's the worst thing I can imagine. That's horrible. <laughs> that's the most horrible social media platform. And I had some people kind of take me through it. And they're like, you know, you could do some things on there. And I was like, that makes me want to die. Oh, man. Like this, yeah. I did it once too. Somebody asked me, I thought I, I did. I thought this is, and because no one can see people are mean too. Mm. On It's like an, it's like zoom, but meaner. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, <laughs> this sucks. This is, you can tell we're in, we're in extra extrovert world when, you know, the next social media platform is clubhouse and everybody's yeah, been like contained for the pandemic. Like for the pandemic, I, I was like, this is great. Is anything different? I did. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to see anyone. Yep. Like, yep. To, yep. You know. So I don't. You, I don't know why you guys are suffering. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. My husband's <laughs> more introverted than I am, and we both work from home. So it was really, literally, in the beginning, like I didn't even notice anything was going on, which I, I very lucky because a, a lot of people suffered in really big yes. ways, obviously. So, um, but that under getting that flow down, like, you know, some of my team members are extremely, extremely extroverted and they are fulfilling, I think, holes in their life experience because they're younger, maybe in the, with, with work. Right. And that, that was never like, it's work. I love doing it and I love what I do, but I'm not looking to it to fill voids in my life mm. like i'm not like work, looking for work to do that and that's the other thing i learned is that's that's really common it's completely okay and that is what it is but um i was i just for work it's like we're saving lives that's what, that's what we do it's it, it's switch for good it was like i wanted to come to the table do the work and then that's it it was kind of like you know not your not your sister not your mom not your best friend i'm not your therapist you're not my, like, we don't really want to go much deeper than like, let's all get to this common goal. We're here because we believe in it. And like, you know, freaking firecrackers move. And, yeah. and that was my flow state as an athlete. And it, it turns out you only have to work completely by yourself. If you, if you want to stay in your own flow zone, like yeah. you, you, you're like completely just, just knocked off my rocker so many times. Like, I don't, it, it, it's been crazy. And I'm, I'm still have not figured it out. I don't think at all. It's, it's really, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Cause is, has any skill set from competing as a high performer, has it transferred at all? And I guess in some ways, has that been a, a, a negative side because yeah. not everyone is as competitive as you and you're working in your leader totally. amongst people that may not be as, you know, alpha or as, 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 yeah. as go getter. Uh, You're so how right. you adjust to that? Yeah, I haven't, and and they hate me. <laughs> it's horrible. because <laughs> I no, am come very on, like, hate you. hard charger. Like I want like yes. results. Like that's why we're here. I don't know why else we would do this work. It's like mm -hmm. results. Like let's get there. Um, mm -hmm. And 
I like to move at uh, somewhat of an uncomfortable pace and speed for others. Yeah. Um, but I also am seeing the other side of, of our work, which is the, our supporters and our donors. And I have to answer to them and I want to answer to them with a high level of impact because that's, yes. that's why they're supporting us. So there is that, there's that pressure, but it's, I love pressure. So it's like, that's, you know, that I, you, I want that to be the pressure and I appreciate that yeah. that's the pressure, but uh, I, I haven't really figured out, you know, it, yeah, I just, I kind of have like this one way that uh, I always was able to find success in mm -hmm. and it's not the case in a, in a group setting, unless you're just, you're, you, you're the only one working there. Yeah. And we yeah. can't do too much if it's just me, <laughs> you know, we're not going to get the, the, the impact. So it's, you know, and there's, there's a couple personalities like, like mine, but, um, but it's, I, I found that it's not very common. So. Yeah. It's, and, it's and rough. I think, I think if anything, more people can learn from how you have been able to channel and, uh, you know, this, this dark place that you've gone through so that you've been able to perform at the highest level. I think most people are actually not struggling with trying to become the most go-getter. They're, they're often trying to motivate themselves, right? So it's, I think you, you kind of have that rare skill set, if, if anything, that you, the other people can learn from. And maybe they're not going to be the ultimate alpha, like go-getter person, but they right. can at least get to that next stage of being able to motivate themselves. So when you were point. performing in front of millions of people and you were in this high pressure zone and you had to get yourself going, right? What were the processes, habits, mentality, mm -hmm. the thoughts that you were going through your head? What were you saying to yourself? Talk to me a little bit about that, how you've been able to get to that zone when it really mattered. Well, this may be a little bit unconventional, but because I came, I think because I came to cycling so late is possibly one of the reasons. Um, I had uh, struggled deeply from imposter syndrome the whole way through. And I was, I struggled really badly from, from nerves and anxiety, like pre-competition, especially on the track, because the track is, it's like, it feels like a fishbowl, you know, you're down there in the center of the track and there's, you know, 10,000 people and you just feel like they're all staring at you, which they're not, they're watching the race, but, uh, it feels like a hyper pressurized, um, bubble because it is the velodrome is, you know, literally that. So I really had to, I didn't ever have too much trouble finding the zone. My problem was I was in that zone too often, all the time. Really? Like, because I was so, I was in, I was doing so much homework on preparing my body and my mind for competition so that I could not let my nerves get in the way of my success. And I was practicing that work so often with my sports psychologist and some of the, yeah. um, you know, methods that we used that, I, I put myself in that space all the time so that I could deal with that space. So it wasn't like, oh, I got to get focused. I was like over-focused was more of the problem. And I had to learn how to metabolize that, quite frankly, really, like really just kind of move through those really intense feelings uh, and, and just be able to be just be able to be in my body, like connect my mind and my body. I had big issues with that. I mean, obviously some of that probably stems from my eating disorder. My mom and mind and body were completely disconnected. And I had to learn to come back into my body uh, in my healing journey. So when it came to competition, it was being present because that's what I struggled with so much, right? Like just being there. Um, and it, it was, it was really, I, I, I don't think I ever put it together as well as I did uh, at, at the Olympics. And that, that was the goal, you know, because that's the Olympics, right? Like multi-time world champions go to the Olympics and get seventh, you know, it's, that's yeah. the Olympics. That's, that's why it's so cool. And so beauty, so beautiful. And my team, I mean, we were, 
we were underdogs. Uh, this, the, the sport that we do track cycling is, is wildly popular in Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, right? It's not here in the States as much. And we were definitely underdogs. We were significantly underfunded compared to those countries. And we were not supposed to even medal. So, you know, that, that delivery on those, what were three rides to the gold medal final, cause you had to do, you know, uh, qualifying semis and finals uh, was ended up for me, thankfully being the ultimate output that I was ever able to, you know, output <laughs> through my entire career. So it just landed on the right two days in August of 2012. <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that for sure. But that, I mean, it, it, it was, I was never really ever able to put it together uh, as well as I was at that, that final, was those final rides of my career. Yeah. That's insane. And I'm curious to know as a competitor person that is over-prepared mentally, just ready, right. You're really going above and beyond to, to, to make sure you've got this work and putting pressure on your team to do so. Mm -hmm. How do you set expectations for yourself and maybe your team, knowing that you guys are the underdogs, mm -hmm. do you set high expectations with high deliverables? And if you fail, you're just going to go through the suffering and that it's okay. Or do you set mm -hmm. okay expectations and hopefully, you know, try to protect yourself, I guess, in some sense, like what's your mentality there? Yeah, we were, we were always very focused on or tried to stay focused. It's not so always easy to do that on um, our controllables and, and not on the uncontrollables, right? Because you have no control over so many aspects. And one of those aspects is obviously your competitors and what they're going to put out. No control. But you will easily obsess over your competitors. I mean, ask any athlete in any sport ad nauseum, right? Because you're trying to kind of peel back the layers and uncover like what's their secret or what. And in track cycling, we're, we're total gear geeks, gear heads. Cause you, in track cycling, you have one gear, right? You, you're not, you, you can't shift. It's, it's, it's a fixie and you have no brakes. So you're always analyzing what gear you're going to ride it, depending on the temperature of the track and the shape of the track and where you are. I mean, it's, it's a math equation really. So you can just go crazy, you know, with all of that. And, and, and so we really tried to focus on uh, are controllable. So in training, we would go way outside. We would color way outside the lines, if you will, what you're saying, right? Because you, that's the only way you can find your limits. It's the only way you can mm. find what you're capable of. But in competition, because track cycling is so analytical, it's so mathematic, we were very specific about what we had the ability to produce and how we were going to put that ride together to produce our very best output. Cause we had a pretty good idea what that was going to be. Let's call it a time. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Um, I want to make sure that we have time to cover the journey you've been through uh, with your plant-based diet, as I mentioned, I, I've watched Game Changers for the first time, and mm -hmm. just fascinating stuff like the analogy of the idea that you know at the end of the day, animals are just the middlemen, and that most yeah. people want to be strong as a gorilla, but when you look at what gorillas eat, it's not meat, yeah. and so that just kind of like blew my mind as I was going through that mm -hmm. and. Talk to what do you think about. of the film? I, I I can't I can't help myself but to ask. I I love the things you picked out from it. That's, yes. Those are those are some of my favorite things too. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe a lot of people are in my in my head, but I just based on my personal journey, I was born in South Korea, where I've had multiple shifts of like what I thought a diet should be, which was like meat. You need a rice bowl and on, on every plate, and uh, I realized that my personal diet does not require that. And mm -hmm. I felt better in many ways when, you know, I was eating fish or I wasn't eating rice and I was eating more salad. And um, I think a lot of people are, I guess, not as informed just because we don't have classes 
around this in our education system. I, yeah. I certainly wasn't taught this. You know, you kind of have to be self motivated to go out there and learn. Uh, but I love the film. I love the way it was. It was. Uh, it was crafted and I'm sure I'd love to get your take on like behind the scenes of like mm -hmm. what it really was around. Um, but I, I guess, why do you think there was, there's such, such a controversy and confusion of what a healthy diet is for majority of society? Well, there's, we're all, not only are we all individually unique, uh, our cultures are all unique, right? So what an indigenous diet was for all the different places and parts of the world were pretty much specific to what you could grow, what, you know, what that climate was going to endure and what you could put on your plate. So, I mean, I think that at the beginning, right, is the reason that there's a, a variety of different types of diet, but coming into the modern age, we've been educated by marketing. Like, I mean, you can't, if you ask anyone ever why they eat meat, they don't know. And it's, I ate meat for 35 years. I, I grew up in the, in the South, in the States. And so barbecue, brisket, macaroni That's and right, cheese, yeah. chicken fingers. I mean, the whole thing. I would have said, I, because everyone else does. I mean, that, right? So that it's just the inundation of marketing by industry. But the, in our whole world, our whole modern world, just like follow the dollar, right? is always, always the answer of why something the way it is, because they want to sell it to us. So they put together their, you know, BS research and tell you that this is most definitely, you know what I mean? I mean, if you just go back to, you know, tobacco in the fifties, there was a couple hundred studies that were done that told us that it kills us. And it took 30 years for any of that to be eked out because they kept it quiet and they, and you know, they had doctors as their spokespeople and it all it is to sell a product. It's fine. It doesn't, you know, it's like, Oh my God, yeah, that sounds crazy. crazy now. I think we're going to be in that space with um, especially processed animal foods, but I think we're going to be in that space, even with just animal foods. I mean, a lot of the science that you learned in the game changers in 50 years from now, I, I mean, we have, I mean, epic proportion at all over the world, but in the United States, the figures are, we lose almost 700,000 people a year of heart disease, mostly of foodborne illness, type two diabetes, second killer of foodborne illness, mm -hmm. cancer, number three, hormonal based cancers, very, very affected by diet, especially dairy, because it's from a pregnant cow and it's full of hormones that are directing our cells to do rogue things. So what we put in our body is pretty critical and the marketers are the ones teaching us about it. So mm. that seems like a problem to me. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking the same thing. We actually, uh, I forgot our last name. It's going to kill me. Barbara, oh. uh, something, but she, she wrote a book mm -hmm. and she outlined the 11 lies that we've been told as a society, cigarettes being one of them, yeah. the idea of coal and, 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 uh, seat belts and all of these things. I think meat was certainly one of them as well. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's just things that we're just starting to figure out. And the, the problem with heart disease stuff, it's, it's not just something where, you know, like a seatbelt, it's fairly obvious, right? You're not going to wear a seatbelt and you see the effects of that immediately because someone, someone has to You're right. get injured or, or, or pass away. But with meat, it's something that accumulates over time, just like the effects of yeah. oxygenating, you know, CO2 over multiple, multiple years and generations. And it seems like we're seeing this trend of meat becoming similar to how we're probably going to see cigarettes 30 years from now. But I guess I see some obstacles, which is there has to be some self motivation with cigarettes. Like it's, I guess it's just something you can, well, I don't want to speak for others, but it's, it's something you can quit. And uh, it's hard to say, I guess with, with there's, it seems like is a, there's a different layer of difficulty of going completely vegan mm -hmm. in when you're surrounded by a culture that is, mm -hmm way more carnivorous and, and focused on meat mm -hmm. versus what smokers have to go through, which is you can kind of just go home and, and 
right? But people have to eat. Right. Well, true. But I will say that I, I think, so I smoked for 12 years. Um, and back then, especially in the, in the South, I mean, you could smoke inside bars, restaurants. I mean, you know, it's nothing like true. it is now. You can't smoke anywhere now. You, you have to go home and smoke, like you said, in your house. But back then it was like meat is now. Like it was, it was commonplace. It was accepted. It was, it was the norm. I mean, everyone kind of smoked. So I was, I, I, I felt, I felt comfortable and, and like I was with the, with, with my peeps and like everything, it was okay. And I wasn't doing anything weird. That's where we are now with meat, right? People feel weird if they're not ordering meat on their plate because everyone's doing it. I mean, it's really just to follow the herd mentality. Well, now it's not as interesting to smoke because, well, I mean, I don't want to smoke. It's been a long time. I'm not going to go back to smoking, but for people that smoke, I think it's a, for some, it's easier to quit than it was in 1980 because it's not popular. No one's smoking. You can't do it anywhere, at least here in California. So, I mean, there's beaches in California that have outlawed smoking. You cannot smoke walking down the street in Laguna Beach. Oh, so really? it's like, yeah, they've. it's the whole city. You cannot light up a cigarette. So it's just the allure is gone unless you're hardcore and you want to go smoke in your house, like you said. Yeah. So I think that's just where we are. So I think because it's cultural and because it is definitely more than norm now, you feel like you're part of the herd. People like to feel like they're part of the herd, right? We're pack animals. We all are. But now with, with smoking, you feel kind of like an idiot if you smoke, like, or just at least stupid. I, I guess that's an idiot. Um, you just like, you know, enough to know that this probably is going to kill you. So if you light up, people look at you right now, they do. He, you're, it's like, oh, way to go, buddy. That's really, um, but that's, you know, maybe we'll be there with meat in 30, 40 years or, or sooner. But I think it's just, it's just culture, right? It's just following the herd and kind of doing what everyone else is doing. But I think there's a, so there's a lot of power in, you know, uh, being different and walking a different road and, you know, standing up for, for what you feel is right. Let's say if you're an ethical uh, vegan, uh, like I am, it, I feel empowered when I'm in a restaurant and I'm like, Hey, waiter, I don't eat animals. So help me out here. You know, we're at a steakhouse and I'm here for work and, or whatever, probably not for work, but <laughs> with what I do, but, uh, and, uh, you know, can you put something together? Can we do like a baked potato? And, and there's there now we're at least in the space where they're very cool about that. That used to be, I, I felt empowered, but it was also annoying because they would look at me like, seriously, lady, like, you know, come like, on, yeah. come on, like this, you've come to a steakhouse, like, are you an idiot? Uh, mm -hmm. But, but now I, I see the acceptance is changing. You know, even when I go home to, to Kentucky, the, for years, restaurants there were like, wait, you're a vegan? You're a, and they're like, oh, we've a, we have a gluten-free menu. You know, you get that. And they're like, oh boy. Uh, now they know exactly what I'm talking about. They know yeah. what, you know, there is. So it's, it, the, the culture's changing, but it, it's always felt empowering standing up for what I believe in, even if it's not popular. It is. Yeah. And I think one thing to add on there, and I don't know if this is something you can change, but I, you know, that it just kind of goes back to full circle around what is the right portion of meals or, or calories to eat that you 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 think is full right i think that adjust based mm -hmm. on the person and for me it's certainly adjusted like where before i think people associate eating meat and protein you know the, the hamburgers as feeling yeah. full yeah versus a salad is like oh that's not enough but obviously there's different ways to make yourself feel full without necessarily needing meat and yeah. i guess that is just a cultural shift that needs to happen you know, one of the things that Japanese people or, or Korean people as I grew up is, is mm -hmm. naturally they're thinner because they use chopsticks instead of spoons to eat. And you just can't necessarily grab yeah. even if you want to. And that shift is really why uh, culturally, you know, generally Asians tend to be skinnier, uh, you know, apart from their meat and stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, I just found all this stuff fascinating. And I think movies like, the game changers is going to really shift the generation for people that aren't aware of it. And that's really what the film does. It was an awareness. It wasn't necessarily the how to. Um, so I guess we mm -hmm. could, we could end it, end it with some tips um, around use chopsticks. And that's like the best side. That's so, I love it. He's so true. It's so simple, 
But I think if, if people just didn't even change their diet, which I shouldn't say because I want them to, but I want them to feel better and be healthier. But uh, just as far as like everybody goes on a diet for weight loss, it's like an $80 billion a year industry. It's, it's just chopsticks. Because our forks from like 1940 to now, have you noticed the size difference? So bigger, we can yeah. shovel like more yeah. food and it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Like the dinner forks now at restaurants, they're just, it's, they're, they're like shovels. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's changed it's a lot. So I'm going to, I'm going to remind myself of that too. And I'm yeah. Feeling a little pudgy to get my chopsticks out. Thank you. We're going to put up a YouTube tutorial <laughs> on how to use chopsticks <laughs> in this video. So that would anyone, be helpful. <laughs> have no fear. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So one piece of advice for someone that is perhaps now just getting aware of the benefits of going vegan or vegetarian, what are yeah. someone, you know, if you were in their shoes and as you have been, what's kind of the first step that they would take? Nothing overwhelming, nothing yeah. that's going to, yeah. you know, get them stressed. Just what's the first thing they should do today, tomorrow to get them started? Yeah. Well, just kind of how we, what we were talking about is, you know, James from the film always says, you know, progress, not perfection, because we're very tied to thinking people get tied to thinking that veganism is a diet. And if you don't do diets or the diet culture tells you that if you don't do diets hundred percent perfectly, forget it, just throw it out. Don't even bother. Right. Yeah. It's not the case. So think of it as more of you're making a lifestyle adjustment or shift and you're just you're curious and you're open to discovery. That's where I want people's minds to be when they're thinking about going plant-based, right? It's not like, you know, it, it doesn't need to be the all or nothing. So I think the first step is adding in more plants. Don't take anything out in the beginning, right? It, 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 let's say whatever, the first week, the first month, however long you need, just that's what you focus on, putting in more plants. Because good God, we all need to be eating more plants. I don't think anyone all the naysayers of that film would still agree we need to be eating more plants. And it is, it is a vehicle to, to, to health and repair and vitality. So just do that. And when, I've, when I have people do that, what I notice, they notice over a period of time, whether it's a short period of time or, or even a couple months, that the, the meat's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they just, or they're not even really interested in any dairy because dairy makes everyone feel horrible. Um, and they're like, wow, I'm, I'm having more energy. I'm sleeping better. My recovery is better if I'm an athlete. Like they're no, and then you just start getting excited and then there's no stopping you. Like let it saturate, let it happen. So just add more plants, add more plants and it'll start to kind of shove off the animals off your plate. And then, but maybe you're still eating a tiny bit or something, you know, whatever you just, just you don't have to go for perfection, right? Yeah. So that's the, that's what I would say. Let me say that's probably, I've asked a lot of people around what are the, the, maybe not a silver bullet, but what are the tips to go into vegetarian or vegan? That's probably one of the best I've heard because so many people are off put by the idea of removing and yeah, having to, I know. there's a loss aversion there, right? Like you, you love this taste and having mm -hmm. to remove it is just not something that it people get excited terrible. about. No. Like and adding a little bit more is, is so easy. It's super easy and, and it will, you probably have talked to me about this. Your taste buds totally change. It's mm. crazy. And no, no one told me that because I did it. I didn't really know too many people that, but so as you're adding it more plants in and, and, you know, I mean, if you think about it, plants are what flavors everything. It's what flavors your meat. I mean, everybody that's the connoisseur of any kind of meat, you marinate it. You don't just like slice it off the cow and stick it on the grill. Like you do stuff to it and it's plants that you're putting in it to, to, to marinate it in, to make it sure. taste a certain way. So like, as you start to discover all the, the flavors out there, um, it's, it's like my, it's, it literally felt to me like it felt when I, when I quit smoking, because you have like a muted palate when you're a smoker, you can't mm. taste like intense flavors. It, the same thing happened when I took the meat and dairy out, when, you know, as, as I took it down, I mean, I kind of went fairly overnight, but it, as you, if you go slow, um, it's your, your, your palate starts to just open up and it starts, you crave what you eat. 
So the more plants you're putting in, the more you're going to start craving that and less the other stuff. And then, like I said, once you start feeling differently, then that's the ultimate motivator because you're just like, wow, this, I, I just want to go all the way, but your taste buds change. So I got to, I tell people to, you know, for those first 21 days, uh, just give it, give it some time and, and, and keep your palate open for kind of listening and, 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 and experiencing the, these new flavors, you know, cause you're, it's, it's, it's kind of wild that transformation that happens. And now, yeah, I, I think I would just, I, I would, I don't know what, I just don't think I could even stand the the pungency or the intensity of like meat now it, it, it there's something about it that would that would just taste because sometimes I smell it and it just tastes um or smells which is connected to your taste it dead like it's because it is even what even plant-based no like dead animal right like right, it okay. just it just kind of it's like well I don't know what smell yeah, yeah, it just, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really strange because I, I mean, like I said, I ate a lot of meat for 35 years. It's not like I'm some kind of, you know, screaming vegan from when I was born and everyone's awful, right? Like, I mean, I, I did same, the same thing. I just didn't know any better. I believed all the lies as an athlete too, that, you know, I needed milk and I needed all these things so that I could be strong and, you know, grow muscle and everything. I, I believed all of the marketing. Yeah. In yeah. many ways, you're kind of going back to the roots. I think there was a, a another like fascinating point I saw uh, that I that I heard in the Game Changers where humans can't produce their own vitamin C. So we're tricolored mm -hmm. vision is That's meant cool, to see it? ripe fruits. I was blown away by that. So yeah. nevertheless, I, I highly recommend people to check out the Game Changers, which of course Dotsy is featured in. Um, Switch for Good is your nonprofit highly recommend people to check that out. That's your life mission. Now that's what you're really yeah. doing to give back to people, uh, throughout, through the experiences that you've been through, where else can people find you online and uh, how can people yeah. reach out? Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. I mean, switch for good can help them on this journey that we're talking about for sure. So do go, do go there. It's switch the number four good.org. Yes. Uh, and yep. then all of our social media switch the number four good. Um, I am on Instagram uh, at vegan Olympian, but I'm not that great at social media. So I'm, <laughs> I'm like the person that posts like once a month, but um yeah, Check there's lots clubhouse. of, there's, oh yeah, I'm all over that. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's not so much my jam, but there's a lot of the, a lot of the people in the film are like a lot younger and they're a lot better at social media. So they're, you know, Nimai does an amazing job on social media and so many of the different uh, people from the film. Um, but yeah, those are the main places. And then, you know, when I listen to podcasts, sometimes I get tips on other podcasts from those podcasts. So we, we have a podcast, it's a switch for good. So if you're dying to just really understand this information, we have incredible physicians, incredible dietitians, uh, celebrities, uh, amazing athletes, like so, so many guests. We're about two years in. And I say we, cause I hosted alongside um, Alexandra Paul who was Baywatch mm -hmm. actress. Like she's done over a hundred films. People know who she is. And she's a, she's a passionate vegan like myself. So we have a great time. So tune into that too. That's amazing. Have you had Gabby Reese on the show? No, but I want to have her and Laird on. Thank you for that yeah. reminder. Yes. Okay. If you, yeah, she's been on our show. Yeah. Oh, it's well, maybe you amazing. could connect us. Cause yes. And, and I, yeah. cause I just got, um, Laird has come out with that, uh, nut, that nut milk creamer. Right. right. Yeah. And I just, I just saw it at the grocery store like two weeks ago and I was like, God, oh, I got it. <laughs> it's awesome. So yes. Yeah. Amazing. They do good stuff. Amazing. Well, Dotsie, I really appreciate your time, all of the wisdom you shared throughout the show. And I highly recommend people to check out everything that she's doing. And uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you.